So for whatever reason, my latest video about the development of quantum computing went absolutely nuts. I'm not sure if it was the fact that the Nobel Prize was given to quantum physicists, or it was just that good a video. But it was clear from the comments that a lot of my audience still doesn't believe that quantum computing is actually real, or does any useful work right now. In order to right these wrongs, and in partnership with IBM who are sponsoring this video, we're going to talk about the road to a world where we can all take advantage of quantum computing, along with where we stand in that roadmap today, along with discussing some cool announcements from IBM's latest quantum summit. In order to do this, I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Jamie Garcia, who is literally the person in charge of quantum applications at IBM. So on behalf of the channel, I'd like to invite Dr. Jamie Garcia. Welcome. Thank you, Ian. Thanks for having me. So to give perspective for the audience, can you describe who you are and exactly what you do? Yeah, so uh, I am the senior research manager for IBM Quantum uh, for applications and application software. So really what that entails is all of the research that we have ongoing in the quantum computing space as to how we can develop quantum computers uh, and use quantum computers for real life valuable applications. That is my team. And then in addition to that, we also help to develop out tools so that you know, people uh, can actually try, try the different techniques that we develop through our research themselves for problems of their own interest. So it's a really uh, broad spectrum of uh, activities that we have on my team. So first up, let's talk about this roadmap. You know, whenever we talk about quantum computing, we use the term qubit as a metric of how complicated we can make it. The more qubits we tend to say we have, the more you can do. And it's all about how you make them, how you entangle them. And the argument is that with 100 perfect qubits, you know, I've heard people say that you can have more compute power than you'll ever need. Where do we sit today with the number of qubits in quantum computing? And for easy reference, I'm going to pull up a chart showcasing uh, at least IBM's roadmap of quantum processors. As of today, we now have 433 qubits uh, available for use. So 433. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of qubits. Uh, they're still noisy devices. So we still have you know, some error uh, in, in the qubits themselves when we run our circuits. There's some error that accumulates because of the noise in the systems. Uh, but we, as of uh, today, we have 433 qubits that we can uh, start looking at and exploring what we can do with a device of that size. So when you say 433, are they all entangled with each other or how does that work? So they are um, structured in such a way that we can run some, some interesting circuits. Uh, it's a certain type of con uh, connectivity that we call a heavy hex uh, connectivity of the qubits. So they kind of, if you look at them, they look like little bricks, uh, you know, that have the qubits around the outside of the bricks, if you will. Um, and so I think that leveraging the connectivity is really important for the algorithms that we like to run for applications. Um, and in addition to that, you know, we also need to consider the different error rates that are uh, available in the qubits and especially for two qubit gates, uh, it's really important for the applications that, that we're doing. So, I mean, in that case, should we simply be tracking Q the number of qubits as a major benchmark? Well, yeah, so uh, <laughs> number of qubits is one thing. There are all sorts of different ways that we need to evaluate the actual quality of those qubits as well. So I think um, you're, you're probably aware of uh, quantum volume as, as being one metric. Uh, so this is the idea of basically like uh, the number of qubits and also uh, thinking about the error rates that are associated when, when you run some of those two qubit gates. Um, so we actually just announced a, a quantum volume of uh, 512. So that, you know, as you can imagine, I think we we uh, announced a quantum volume of eight <laughs> back in 2019. So we've come a long way uh, very quickly with in terms of our quantum volume. Um, and so the, that was on our Fal our new Falcon R10 uh, processor. So it just I think speaks to the fact that we are continuously improving the quality of the qubits. Um, this is really important for, for the types of algorithms that, 
that we want to look at um, because a lot of them have depth uh, associated with them, which basically means that you're repeating uh, different, you know, parts of the the calculation, if you will. And what that means is that if there's any noise in the system and if there's any errors, they do tend to accumulate. So for us, uh, the quantum volume is important. Um, in addition to that, uh, we need to think about, you know, the software. So plops is another one. So circuit uh, layer operations per second is another thing that needs to be taken into account because if if you have a great device, but you can't run anything on it, or it takes an entire lifetime because you're waiting for latencies in the software, that's not great either. So like that is another, I would say like metric and something that needs to be taken into account is like, how do you actually use the devices that you have that have high quality and have a large number of qubits? And then finally, the last thing that I think is really important is how do you evaluate um, the architecture that you have and the quantum computer that you have available to you in terms of like how well it's running a circuit. Um, so we, uh, we've introduced this, this idea of gamma um, to be able to understand like how well circuits actually run on, on devices and, um, and the concept of error mitigation uh, to be able to run circuits today that you'd normally think of would be in a fault tolerant regime uh, way pushed out into the future. So I think all of these things collectively are, are really important uh, when you're thinking about the practicality of quantum computing and, and actually being able to look at use cases and applications um, with quantum computers. So, I mean, the, the, uh, perhaps the hypothetical situation is I'm going out to a store to buy a quantum processor, right? <laughs> if, it's a if it was a standard processor, it'd be like, okay, from this company and it has this many cores and it runs at this frequency. Instead, in the quantum world, we're talking about first number of qubits, but then the quantum volume and then this, you know, clops or op you know, operations that it can perform. And then the error rates. And then with, with, with the error rates, I think what's important here is to draw the parallel with traditional compute. I mean, why does quantum computing have to deal with errors? You know, when I run my processor at home, there there are no if if there's, if there's an error, I'm sending it back, right? It's <laughs> failed within a warranty. So why would a quantum processor have an error? Yeah. Well, I mean, so quantum computers are especially, you know, sensitive to their environment, kind of by by default, and so. One of the things that um, is a constant challenge is how do you how do you increase the coherence times of the of the qubits and how do you, they need to be long enough so you can actually process and store uh, quantum information and and be able to to run some of the you know circuits that that you're interested in within again a reasonable time frame. Um, so the coherence is really important and it's susceptible to noise of all types. I mean, this is part of the reason why we cool our uh, dilution refrigerators down to 15 millikelvin, for example, is like, it's like, you know, colder than outer space <laughs> where the qubit actually, uh, you know, operates. And that's, that's for good reason, because if you have any heat come in or, you know, even like radio waves that are, are not um, the ones that, that we want to program, that can allow things to decohere. It can al allow kind of loss of, of information, uh, storage capabilities, right? And manipulation capabilities. So that is, that's why uh, we have error associated uh, with it. Um, it's, it's kind of inherent in, in, uh, in quantum computers. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of research in, in trying to figure out like what exactly to do with that error. Um, how do you correct for that error? How do we get to a point where we do have error corrected devices and then what needs to be developed along the way, you know, cause we can't wait, right. In terms of like error mitigation. So, so being able to model uh, the error and then being able to backtrack out like what a perfect answer would be. Um, so there's a lot of active research and ongoing in that. And we use it constantly um, in our own applications research. So, I mean, j just to simplify that a little, does that mean that say you have 10 qubits, you may be using four or five of them just for error correction rather than actual compute? Right. Yeah. Like that's the idea is that there's, uh, so in an error corrected regime, you're trading off uh, scale, right? So you need to have lots and lots and lots of qubits. Um, these are, uh, you know, when people do 
for example, resource estimation and and trying to get a sense of like how many qubits you would need to to run some of the error corrected codes. Um, a lot of times you'll you'll see numbers in like you know the millions, right, of qubits. Um, so when you're thinking about applying you know error corrected code, um, that those are the types of of numbers that you end up seeing and estimates that you end up seeing in that case. Uh, so yeah, it could be, you know, there, there's a, there is a trade-off and it depends a lot on the code, like what that ratio is of like, you know, how many physical qubits you need to, to have a logical qubit. Um, and it will, it'll depend a lot on not only the problem, but also what type of error correction you're implementing. And then also like, you know, uh, combinations too with with error mitigation as well. So all of those things kind of collectively have to be taken into account. So is is this error correction directly related to the to to the you know uptime of these qubits? Because I know you guys are presenting uh, you know new record coherence times for for your qubits. Yeah, I mean, so the the error correction um, it. It will depend on it, it also depends on the coherence times, right? So when you when you do the resource mm -hmm. estimations, the better the coherence, um, longer coherence times you have, uh, and the lower the error rate, uh, then that by default like will you know feed into the resource estimation you do, and that would lower the number of qubits that you would need overall. So yeah, as like as the devices continue to improve and get to better and better, you can kind of you can do estimates based on different uh, two qubit error rates that you know you theoretically have, and you can kind of back backtrack out of that like how how uh, many qubits you would need to do a, a type of a calculation. Um. Well, when I was last touring uh, the facilities, people were talking about uh, doing shots yeah. of of their quantum circuits. So, is this is is this simply repeating the same calculation and making sure you get the right result repeatedly? Yeah, a sort it, of stochastic result. Yeah, that's right. So you you do you know we used to do somewhere around in the neighborhood of like ten thousand shots ish, like per per run on something. And again, it's yeah, it's it's like sampling. You're just sampling over and right. over again. Yep. Um, so, 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 when you say a run is could should, would we think about that as say like a classical calculation? I mean, it, everybody yeah. says quantum computers can't do one plus one equals two, right? It's it's that sort of. <laughs> yeah, level. I mean, it's yeah, it depends on on the problem that you're looking at, but you know, it's it's whatever sort of observable you are are look, like in chemistry, for example, it might be getting a data point for like um. Uh, for an energy value, uh, for example, so something like that, and keeping in mind too that it's it's always there's always a trade off with what we're doing on the classical side as well. Um, so, for example, with error mitigation, we really heavily utilize uh, classical post processing as a as a part of a part of this. Um, so it's it's taking again all those things into consideration but and yeah so like if you're running a calculation on a classical device you could think of it as getting you know starting to collect that data you know to to make like for example um an energy like dissociation curve for for a molecule for example so yeah it's like getting those data points and then putting in on your plot a data point at a time to build <laughs> out that that answer so, I mean, as part of this quantum summit, IBM has announced, you know, this 100 by 100 initiative. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm led to believe that in the world of quantum computing, it's very rare for a company to put a stake in the sand and say, you know, here's a benchmark we have to aim for. Can you go into what this 100 by 100 means and how it can be achieved? Yeah, so 100 by 100 is essentially a tool, right, uh, that we're, we're creating. So it's a uh, it's 100 qubits with the capability to have like 100 you know, a depth of a hundred. And so the question now is, and it, it's sort of a challenge uh, for everyone <laughs> to look at together, <laughs> to think about like, what is what is it exactly that uh, we think uh, we'll be able to do with that, right? So like, what what is the next step? But it's a new tool. Uh, we haven't had it, we haven't had that kind of hardware available like at all. And so it's it's effectively like okay what what can we do with this um, what kind of proof of uh, you know concepts I'd say but even like 
beyond that, like what kind of utility uh, do we think that it'll have? Um, it does allow us to, to start accessing some uh, new and interesting uh, regime associated with uh, error mitigation and, and especially with our uh, PEC, so our probabilistic error cancellation, uh, error mitigation technique that, uh, that we recently announced. And so it allows us to start trying some things out there um, and getting to a point where you actually have the potential to reach a regime where you have noiseless, a noiseless shot, right? So like, it'll be interesting to see what okay. we end up, what people end up doing with it. Um, you can envision, uh, you can envision trying some, some really interesting theoretical examples uh, with a system like that. And again, I think it's really just about not otherwise having anything like that um, to be able to test some of these ideas. So it's a really exciting time. So, <laughs> so, so, so when you say 100 qubits with the depth of 100, what do you mean by depth in that circumstance? Yeah. Again, trying to bring it back to classical computing. Does that just mean loops in a in an algorithm or something? Yeah, it's effectively. So again, depth is really important for for running certain types of circuits. Um, and they, yeah, it's it's effectively uh, running a part of the circuit, and you do it multiple times. Um, and so because of that, you know, if say for example. Um, you want to look at it like a, a chemistry problem of some type. If you want to do it in a, in a way that, you know, you're going to effectively be beating sort of the classical algorithm, you need to have really high depths. Like that's just, that's a part of uh, sort of the, you know, what's core and central to those types of, of circuits. And so uh, in the many instances, like when we do our, our research today, like we might only run, you know, an example that has a depth of three, where in reality, we would love to be able to have a depth of, you know, however many, like, uh, really like to have an unlimited depth would be like, <laughs> ideal, right? So anyway, you can see like, there's a big leap going from three to 100, even in, in that instance. Um, and so I think like, yeah, that that tends to be uh, very sensitive to noise. Uh, that tends to be why we can only run like pretty shallow depth circuits. And so it really does open a question, right? If you have the ability to have higher depth, what can you do with it? Um, and so I, I think that's that's really the um, I think the significance of of introducing this tool is even just having that as an option uh, over and beyond like what we've had available to date. And in, in order to get that depth, in order to be able to reuse the, those circuits, you need longer residence times, lower error rates, and that all plays into into that into that same messaging, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely right. So I think what it really shows is uh, how far we've come in terms of like having that increased coherence times, the the decrease in the error rates, um, so that we can so that we can build a device that even though it's 100 qubits, it's not 433 qubits, for example, but does have like the access to the that larger depth. Um, so I think like, you know, as we continue to uh, push push things forward in terms of like the hardware capability, we're going to start seeing like more interesting, like, uh, you know, different flavors, if you will, of it that, that we can use to problem solve, which in the end of the day, that's what my team is the most interested in. So, so on that thread, people, as I think I say to the beginning, that people still say, well, who uses quantum computing today? And what exactly are they using it for? It still seems very pie in the sky for a lot of people, this sort of magical thing. But <laughs> if you guys are pouring thousands and thousands of you know people hours into it it's got to be able to do something right <laughs> yeah so i mean our team uses them every day uh we use quantum computers on an, as like a daily uh occurrence to look at different problems uh we tend to break them down to, into three different kind of large bucket categories so the first is simulation of nature um, and so that can be anything from chemistry to physics examples, material science examples, all, all fall into that uh, category. 
Um, and then we have uh, mathematics and processing data with complex structures. So quantum machine learning is in this category. You might have some really interesting applications in, for example, nonlinear differential equations. Um, so there's some really interesting uh, things that we can do here. Um, I guess like the famous algorithm that people know of in this, uh, this one is Shor's uh, for factoring numbers. So that uh, kind of falls into this category. And then the last one is uh, uh, kind of a catch-all like that we call other, but in, the, in that category is search and optimization uh, type of uh, applications. And so I think the, the famous algorithm that people uh, think of here is Grover's. Um, so those, those are the three big buckets of, uh, very active areas of research, um, here, both in algorithm, fundamental algorithm development. And then in addition, you know, really, uh, evaluating what we, what we can do today, um, towards really valuable problems, um, that, you know, in a large part are set by our, our, uh, partners and our partnerships uh, really help guide what those, you know, problems of value are. And then we look at the quantum algorithms and and starting to think about how we would map the problems onto quantum circuits and and really start to to get some insights uh, into uh, as we're we're doing problem solving uh, towards these different use cases. So I we uh, we work with quantum computers every day. It's not sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> there's there there you know yeah and anyone can try them out today in fact you know even going online and 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 trying it out for free um as a part of ibm quantum but yeah it's a uh, it's a very rich area of uh scientific discovery right now in this space and i'm personally extremely excited about what we're uh able to see even now so well yeah, I mean, so so speaking about that computational chemist, and and you mentioned Kiskit in there, and uh, Kiskit's kind of like the software development kit that IBM yeah. presents for quantum. Um, I wanted to ask you, how is that software presented today? I mean, are we at a stage where a non-quantum coder can kind of pick up a library that will automatically design the circuits needed, or are we still building out the libraries in order to be able to do that? Yeah, I mean, so that's another part of our our roadmap is uh, building out this uh, serverless la layer that includes, you know, intelligent orchestration, uh, the circuit knitting toolbox, and then in addition to that, the circuit libraries that you, you're kind of referencing. So that that's a big piece of uh, what we're doing in our roadmap. And the other thing that we're we're working on is, uh, you know, application services. So what does that very top layer look at? Right now, it, you know, it depends on where you, you want to come in at in the, the stack um, and, you know, in terms of like how much background knowledge you have, working knowledge of, of quantum and how deep you want to go uh, with it. Um, but certainly these tools that, that we're working on developing that are software tools are going to enable that, that type of research. Um, I'll give one example. So in the circuit knitting toolkit, um, we have a variety of different, you know, methods that that someone can use towards their research. And it kind of, again, goes back to uh, working uh, in a noisy regime uh, with quantum computers today. Uh, how do we best model uh, something to, you know, how do we best like map those circuits on onto the quantum hardware and how can we get to the most accurate results, even if we only have a few qubits. And so there's a technique called entanglement forging uh, that can be used to basically have the number of qubits that are required uh, to do um, a certain, to run a certain uh, circuit of a certain size. So an example would be like, if you had for the water molecule, you normally need 10 you know, qubits, uh, you could, with entanglement forging, break it down into five qubit chunks, um, which then again, at the after you run them, at the end, you can recombine, uh, or you can rather, you can combine them together to get the answer, the same answer that you would have gotten on 10 qubits. So those are the types of tools uh, that we're working on building out uh, today so that people, you know, who are interested and want to try it, but don't necessarily know about quantum computers, how they work, they or how to even program one will be able to come in and with their problem. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, and so uh, I've had a go online, and uh, you know, there's a web interface for like a four qubit system, and you can play around with some of the operations, and uh, it's way above my head. <laughs> but you know, it's uh, I've I haven't been in that space for years, or at least in the computational chemistry space. So, um, yep. I, I I guess my I guess my next question here is: um, Is there any way to convince people that quantum computers are actually worth the time and the effort? You know, Normally, in in traditional computing, we talk about having a killer application for a device or a a new a new type of processor. Mm -hmm. Do we need that in quantum? I mean, I think that so, yeah. The so a couple of things here. One is that you know quantum is not at least at least I don't envision it as being something that is going to like replace all classical, right? So that just FYI, this is something that is a new tool that is added to like the, you know, the toolbox, if you will, um, in terms of, of something to try out for different problems. Um, quantum really excels uh, in certain areas and especially areas that have a lot of dynamic kind of interconnectedness. So like, if you think about data, like for, you know, quantum machine learning, for example, and being able to um, uh, classify different types of data, that, that is something that quantum computers are expected to be good at. Um, you know, factoring numbers, but not addition and subtraction, right? It's not like a pocket calculator. Um, and then chemistry, again, because of its interconnectedness, uh, just sort of by default uh, with the way that electrons interact with each other, uh, quantum computers represent that really well. So we're expecting uh, big advances there. So I think that, you know, when we talk about quantum advantage and where we would get an advantage using a quantum computer or a quantum processor over a classical one, um, it's going to be in areas such as what I just described. Um, and then alongside, you know, uh, classical components as well. And perhaps even, you know, so we talk about QPUs, CPUs, and GPUs, and that there are going to be workloads for different types of problems that, that people are interested in that leverage them in various kind of like degrees, right? And there will be an optimal kind of path, if you will, where you use like a QPU for one part of the calculation, CPU for another, and maybe a GPU for another. And really it's the power of weaving all of these together um, towards, uh, towards your killer applications. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of that traditional roof line model of compute and memory, we now need another dimension that's sort of like the quantum volume requirements of a calculation. Yes, yeah, exactly. So how and how do you uh, how do you think about uh, yeah optimizing across those different workloads? It's a that is in and of itself another really interesting research question, by the way. So. So to, to, so to wrap it all up, um, I've kind of prefaced this uh, this interview by saying that a lot of the audience who don't believe in quantum computing, what would you say to those people as kind of like an end piece to this? Uh, I would say that quantum computing is, you know, first and foremost, it's something that we use on a daily basis already. Uh, we're evaluating and looking at different applications using quantum computers today. It is real. It's coming. <laughs> and I think like the earlier you get started learning about it and understanding, you know, what they're good at and like what they can be used for, um, the better. So I think, you know, starting now uh, to, to start learning about quantum computers, if you know nothing about quantum computers, is, uh, is probably a wise choice. That's perfect. Thank you, Jamie, for taking time to be with us here on the channel and uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. <laughs>